Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech Radio Controlled Early Production German Tiger 1. Since the last video update, you'll notice that the model's exterior has changed quite a bit. The vehicle now is in its base coat and the markings have been applied. Exactly how I go about doing this will be thoroughly discussed in this video, so stay tuned, there's a lot of cool stuff coming. And here's the model now taken apart one last time before I could go ahead and get it to paint. What I'm doing now is that I'm cleaning out the inside of any dirt and debris from the construction as well as I'm also labeling all of the various switches and gizmos so that the customer knows exactly what all these bits of equipment do. Now in addition to that I do want to go over another new addition that I added to this model that was not mentioned in the last videos and it's definitely a new bit of, of equipment that's very important to point out. Let me go ahead and bring the camera in so you get to see exactly what I'm talking about. And that new bit of equipment is located right here in the front of the batteries. What this is, is a battery shutoff switch. Now, if anyone is a fan of the channel and have seen the last King Tiger update that I recently posted, I went ahead and went into more information about this bit of equipment. What this thing does is that this shuts off the batteries completely and isolates it from the rest of the tank circuitry. Why this is important is that even with the tank powered off, it will still drain the batteries after duration of time, to which point comes when you want to start the tank, the batteries are going to be either completely discharged or are going to have very little juice left in them. With this system here, this eliminates that entirely, and you can have the tank charged up, you could store it for a long duration of time, with the batteries in the cutoff position. When it comes time to actually take it out and run it, you just go ahead, hit the switch here, and the tank is now ready to be powered on. Currently it is powered off. As you can see with the model switch powered on, there is no juice going into the circuitry. However, if I hit the switch, you can see that the tank powers up. This little box here, as I mentioned in the other video, I have been adding onto all of my new current generation of builds as well I'm also going to be retrofitting all of the other 1-6 scale armor tech builds that I have in the shop with the same bit of equipment. The box itself was acquired off of Amazon.com and the link is listed in the description below in case anyone out there wants to add this bit of equipment to their models which by the way I strongly recommend. Moving our way to the rear brings us back to the engine deck. Now one feature that I do at the build prior to painting is that on the inside here I go ahead and insert pieces of paper. The paper covers up the two fan and radiator cluster area and the reason for this is quite simple. I don't want paint to get into these recesses here. With all the interior detailing that was added, if I go ahead and just paint the unit with these pieces exposed it's going to ruin the nice paint and weathering work that I did on those bits of equipment and it's kind of anticlimactic. So I go ahead and mask them up at this point with paper and tape. After the painting is concluded I go ahead and take the mask out leaving the inside completely intact. It is also at this point where I could go ahead and fit on the hubcaps. If anyone was noticing during the test drive footage the hubcaps weren't present on the sprocket hubs. The reason for that has to do with the test drive itself. I wanted to test drive the model for one last time to make sure that the sprockets are properly affixed to the spindle. If there's any sort of play or if there's any sort of wobble from the sprockets this could work itself loose during that point and if the hub is mounted on I'm gonna have to pry it off in order to recalibrate the sprocket. Fortunately that wasn't the case the sprockets performed absolutely perfectly so at this point now we could go ahead and get this guy fitted. You'll notice that he has a coat of primer and for the installation, I'm going to use the same system that I've used on the other ArmorTech builds that have been posted on the ECA channel in the past. And that's with the use of silicone. The silicone, like I mentioned all too common, is a nice, at least for a nice, strong, durable bond, that is also temporary. In that, in case I ever need to get access to the spindle, you can just pry the piece off without causing any damage to the hub or to the sprocket itself. But the piece stays on in a nice secure manner where you don't have to worry about it popping off on you during operation. Now if you notice, I'm not using a whole lot of material, just a small little bead. And if you're noticing, I'm adding it to the inside portion of the sprocket itself. 
the reason why I'm not adding it to the rim is that if you add it to the rim, when it comes time to install the piece, the silicone is going to gush out on this corner here and then you're going to have a seam to wipe away. If you do it this way, when you insert the piece in, the silicone is going to expand on the inside, thus preventing any, or should be reducing any sort of smear on the outside portion. Let's go ahead and find out. Oh, before I go ahead and do, the sprockets, the sprocket hubs do fit on the kit units, but I found are a very, very tight fit. To open up the tolerances just slightly with a Dremel with a sanding drum, I carefully just went over the inside diameter here with one or two passes. It was just a slight amount of material that only needs to be removed just so the piece can slide directly into place, but not too loose where obviously it can fall out. There we go. All right, from here, it's time to pop the tracks, put the tank on some blocks, and get this guy into paint. Greetings from the future of spring 2020. Nah, I'm just screwing around. What I'm actually doing right now is that we have a really unseasonably warm November day, and I'm taking the advantage to wash thoroughly these tracks which is a good thing because tomorrow the weather is going to be basically freezing, which would be making it almost impossible trying to get these guys thoroughly washed clean. Now, because of the test driving, dirt likes to build up in these recesses over here in the grousers, as well as also in these small little confines that we have on either ends of the track. Now, like I mentioned frequently in these build videos, when the tank is up to this point where it heads off into paint, it's also time to focus on the track. And because of which I like to thoroughly wash the tracks completely clean of any sort of dirt and debris just prior to getting them into their base coat of primer. With the tracks thoroughly cleaned off, it makes for a much more representable build by having the tracks thoroughly coated without having clumps of dirt and other crap found on the links cluttering them up and really hurting the look of the build. Now, from my experience, the garden hose really does really short work of this. With a little bit of pressure, after a few swipes, the tracks would be completely cleaned. Of course, hit the inside portions of the track as well. Now, at this point, I'm going to take a moment to mention that I've seen in a lot of my other Armor Tech build videos, a lot of people commenting on the track material themselves. They seem to, to have questions about the two types of material being the alloy of the track links combined with the steel of the rods. Some individuals are worried that the two materials are going to cause problems with each other, which will lead to the tracks, I guess, oxidizing and possibly breaking over time. From my experience of working on these tanks, I've never seen that being an issue or even anything of concern. Now, another question I get is, why do I even prime the tracks to begin with? With the tracks being metal, should they be left as is? Because they kind of look good with their overall coloring. And the answer is, well, yes, they do look pretty good in left in their bare natural metal, but the tracks on the real German tanks did have a very dark, oxidized, parkerized type finish to them. And this is best done with a couple coats of dark gray primer. Now, one advantage about these tracks being metal is that one is that when the tank is driven, of course, where it makes contact with pavement or the ground, the primer on these surfaces here are going to wear down, leaving for the bare metal to be exposed and getting for a nice, very realistic appearance, which on other builds is something that you would have to mimic with techniques like dry brushing. With these armor techs, that's just not the case. Also, you can see that even though the metal colors on the inside here, you can see that not every link is the basic same color, and there are some slight variations between them. In my opinion, with the pieces thoroughly painted, it gives a much better representation of what these tracks would have looked like in real life, and also makes it a lot more uniformed in coloring. With the tracks now fully washed, I could snail them back up, let them thoroughly dry and aerate, to which then they'll be ready for their base coat of dark gray primer. And here's the model now finally in its base coat. Now, throughout the duration of this build, I've had several people ask me in the comment section exactly what color scheme was this build going to be painted with? Was I going to go with a camouflage? Was I going to go with Africa Core? Well, the model is going to be painted for the eastern front with all Panzer Grey. This was the color that was picked out by the customer, and the model is going to progress further from this point with the markings and then the final weathering. 
Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any footage of me actually applying the paint to this model, and the reason for that was, quite simply put, when I was painting this model, we got hit with a really, really bad cold streak, and it was, frankly, rather unpleasant just getting the model into paint. Because of the size of these 1-6 scale tanks, you can't really paint them indoors. You'll just make a mess of everything. They're best painted outside. Now, generally, Painting one of these large-scale models in any other time of the year is actually pretty pleasant. You're outside, the sun is out, you just, with your respirator, with a spray gun, and you're just applying the layers of paint. Once the paint's on the model, they tend to dry pretty quick in the nice sunlight, and then you just hit it with a second or tertiary coat if necessary. Painting in the wintertime is a polar opposite, and it sucks really, really bad. You're outside, you have gloves on, you basically look like you're scuba diving with your respirator and all the layers of clothing. And with the paint, applying the paint you have to be really careful because with the slower dry times in the wintertime, you have a more of a bad tendency on having several layers begin to drip on you. This really needs to be paid attention by the painter, specifically when you're painting one of these things out in colder climates. So you're going to be going through more thinner coats as opposed to some with thicker coats during warmer months. Another problem that I have with painting in the winter time is in addition to the slower dry times, with the type of paints that I use, they are a water-based exterior latex. And when you're out in the colder climates, the water that's used to dilute the paint will actually freeze on the tank surface, which obviously now extends the drying time further. When this happens, it's no big deal. Just wheel the model into the shop again, and the nature will take its course. The ice will thaw, and the paint will begin to dry and adhere like it would in a normal manner. But again, this just takes up a lot of time. So much so that it took me approximately three days, three days, to get the model painted in the condition that you see it here, which would normally take me about an afternoon when done in basically any other time of the year. Now another common question I frequently get is what do you use to paint one of these models? Obviously you can't just buy a bunch of little bottles of Tamiya or Model Master to get the, a model this size into paint. Some people go with car paints. Me personally, I really don't like using that medium. Car paints are just, they just, whenever you see a build painted with them, they kind of stick out like a sore thumb in my opinion. For my builds, I actually use exterior latex paint. Here goes the, the paint right here. I have a small little bit mixed. Now, my colors are actually custom mixed. I come up with my own shades, and then I have them mixed in gallon form at a home improvement store. These paints, they work very, very well on all these large-scale models. I've even used them on my smaller-scale models as well. Uh, I've Obviously, my collection has several of these Armatech tanks that are fully ready to control, and many of them are aging to the point of getting close to tw the 20-year mark, and they... The exterior paint on them is just as good as basically the day that it was applied. So the paint is very, very durable and holds up quite well. Now for the application, like I said in the last Tiger One build video that I did a little while ago, for the main panels, this is done with the use of a spray gun. The spray gun gives you a nice overcoat and it does it in a fairly quick manner. Long as, of course, you dilute the paint proper, properly and you have a really good air compressor. I can't really stress that enough. An air compressor is key to a good paint job. With a good air compressor outputting some really decent PSI with a nice spray gun, you can get the model thoroughly painted very, very quickly. Now, even though the spray gun does do a really good job at the basic panels, you are gonna have some nooks and crannies, namely like under here, under the S-mines or the headlights, or even on some sections over here on the engine deck where the spray gun is just not going to reach. Now, you don't want to try to get the spray gun to get into here with these areas because the amount of volume of paint that it's going to output will be too much and you're going to cause problems with drips and paint buildup in areas where you really don't want that. For the fine detailing aspects of the paint finish, that is done with my double action airbrush. I use the exact same paint. It's already diluted enough for the spray gun and it works just as good in my small little paint cup over here. With the airbrush, I could go ahead and get into the fine little areas with just the right amount of paint where it thoroughly coats it, but it's not too much where it can cause issues. Same is true for the turd as well. Now, 
On the turret, the areas to watch out for are those sections underneath the smoke grenade launchers, as well as the units behind the mantlet. And you'll also see that the storage bin has been removed off the model during the painting process. Those are painted separately and of course they're going to be painted, weathered, and fitted after the turret is remounted to the upper hull. Now on this model you'll notice I went ahead and took the turret off for the paintwork. This is because, let me pan back over here, I wanted to get the top deck thoroughly painted to avoid any risk of there being any spots left over from the airbrush missing it. This is also going to be true with the weathering. Once I'm done with the double shading and the double toning, if the turret is on, you're going to kind of have a ghosted image of where the turret was, and it kind of hurts to look in my opinion. By doing it separately like this, you get the right amount of paint in the right areas. Now to cover up the turret hole, you notice I just used a five gallon paint bucket lid, which was then mass taped in place to cover up those fasteners that secure the turret in place. Obviously you don't want to get paint on those because that can cause issues with the fitting and the threads not having the fasteners going properly. Just to avoid that headache, just mask them up like I did. Some of the other mask work that I did was to the exhaust manifolds, like we recall from the earlier videos. These were pre-painted and pre-weathered prior to the heat shields being fitted on. Obviously you don't want these to be painted at this point so I went ahead and masked them up. Shortly after filming this take the masks are going to be removed leaving for the piece with its original weathering. Then I go ahead and match the weathering on the remainder of the exterior locations during the weathering phase of the build. Same was also done to the row wheels. Like I mentioned again in a much earlier video, the row wheels are thoroughly painted and weathered prior to installation along with the intersection here of the hull. Of course, obviously when the wheels are fitted on, you're not gonna be able to get these painted thoroughly because of the Tiger One's design. So that's why I always pre-paint these pieces. This is true for again, all tanks really. Now on the model here, when it came time to painting, I went ahead and masked them up with plastic bags just to shield them from any sort of overspray. Now one touch up that I did make to the wheels was that on the center hubs and also on the outer fasteners, for the longest time these were left in their original, in the white coloring, specifically these fasteners over here. And again, this was during the assembly phase. With the mask removed, with the airbrush, I was able to go ahead and apply the base coat to these absent areas. Again, this is why you want to have the fine detail work done with the airbrush as opposed to with the spray gun because trying to get that spray gun to just get this small area over here is going to be a fool's errand. While on the topic of masking, this is also true for the headlights, the front visor, and since this tank does have cameras on the turret, the periscope where the cameras was another location that needs to be taped up along with the main gun. Obviously, you want to mask up light emitting sections or areas where you don't want the paint to get into because trying to clean the paint off can be a little troublesome. Now on this periscope here, unfortunately, the mask blew off when I was painting it and I did get some overspray on this, but I'm gonna have to polish that away with a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol, which should make short work of the overspray paint and the piece will be restored to its original coloring. Well, now that the base coat is added, the next step at the model's construction is to add the markings. Now, the markings is really not something I talk about too much in detail on my other videos. Basically, for the markings on my 1-6 scale models, I like to utilize stencils, and for stencils, I actually produce my own. By using this method, I am able to get the exact marking and marking layout that I need for any number of builds, and I'm not shoehorned with using just a certain set size of numbers or insignias. I can scale them up or down as, in any way I deem fit. The markings themselves are laid out in Photoshop. From What I do is I take measurements of the marking on the tank, and I'm able to really figure out exactly how big dimensionally the markings are gonna be. From there, I go into the computer, I type them out, and I print them out on some paper. It may take a few attempts to get the exact size that you're looking for, but once you have the correct size, the paper I use here is sticker paper. With the sticker paper, I go in with a very sharp X-Acto. I cut out each and every one of these little numbers and the crosses. And from here, I then am able to stick them to the side of the model, mask up the area around, and then airbrush the color of the marking onto the model surface. 
Now, a lot of people are wondering, well, why don't I just use decals? And the problem, and the reason why is really twofold. First, when it comes to decals, I don't really like using them on large scale models. Decals are great on smaller scale items, but when you go larger scale, they tend to offer some issues. They tend to rip easier, in my opinion, and also from what I've seen in my experience. They rip easier, they can flake, you have to add some kind of a lacquer to them, then you may have some kind of sheen or a shine and maybe silvering as the thing ages. It's just a little bit more troublesome. With the paint method, first and foremost, it's more realistic. This is how the markings were applied on the real vehicles. So you already have that going for you. Second, the paint is obviously much more durable compared to the decals. They are water resilient, they're weather resilient, they just blend right into the finish, and when you do your weathering, you just go right over them without the fear of the pieces blowing off or disintegrating on you. They do have, it's realistically the best way to do any sort of markings. Decals are more of a convenience thing, again, for smaller scales. Now, like I said before, these are going to be cut out with an X-Acto knife, and this does take a little bit of time, but once it's done, you're going to have some really nice outcome or results with it. Now I'm going to be utilizing this little box cutter here. I'm going to chip off this blade so I have a nice sharp blade. I can't recommend that enough. When you're doing the cutting out, you need to have a very sharp blade. Otherwise, when the blade dulls, you're going to not cut through the paper as much as you're going to snag and draw the, 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 the piece and it's going to leave for a raggedy edge. And it's going to, it's not, doesn't make the decal or the marking useless, but it does take a little bit more cleanup as opposed to if you just use a brand new blade. Now for the German crosses, you'll see that I printed out four sets. The reason is for the German cross, you really need to do it in two layers. The first layer is going to be the black for the main center cross. And the second layer is just for the little white in the in stripes that are on the corners. The way I do these crosses is kind of like the way it's done in the print field where you put the marking on first with the first color and then you put the stencil directly over it in the correct location and when you airbrush that second tone you'll have both of the colors there. So enough talking let me go ahead and start cutting out these stencils. Well, here I am back in the shop, and I'm going to go ahead and start cutting out the markings from the sticker paper. Now, to do this, I like to utilize a foam book to use as a base. If you have one of those cutting boards with some kind of soft cork type backing, that will be useful to me. I like to ghetto it up with the foam book. It does the same job. Basically, you want something soft so that when you're plunging in with your blade and cutting, you're not going to be dulling it too much. Now, like I said before, I cannot stress enough, you need to have a nice sharp blade when doing this trick. So to do that, luckily this is a snap blade, so I'm just going to grab this used one, pop it off, just close that properly. Once the blade is nice and sharp, I can go ahead and start cutting out the markings. Now for the numbers, I generally do this freehand, and for the crosses, I like to use a ruler just to make sure I have a nice straight edge. Again, what's best would be a ruler with a cork. Backing really keeps it down, prevents it from sliding on you. Now, these numbers here aren't too bad. It gets actually really hairy when you're doing American vehicles because of all those T, O, and E markings where you have USA, and then there's a lot of small undercuts. and It's doable, just it takes a little bit longer. But for the German tanks, eh, relatively easy. Now I'm going to go ahead and start my incision. Now on the threes, I like to start with the flat edges first, which are these three here. And then from there, I'm now going to start go ahead and cutting out the remainder. And when you're done, you'll have a three cut out. Ones are relatively quick. Now let's do the five. Now normally when I do this, I'm actually listening to a YouTube video or some kind of podcast. It helps clear the mind, so to speak. Now, while I'm doing this, I want to point out that some people like for markings to use the reverse stencil trick, which is where you paint the color of the stencil on, or the marking on the vehicle, and then with the loose numbers like I have here, 
you go ahead and stick these to the model and then paint the model over with the base coat. That is very similar to this concept, but just a mirror image of it. Now that, a lot of people swear by that technique. Me personally, it's not a technique that I like, and I like going with the more traditional aspect where you paint the model first and then add the markings. But if it works for you, you know, it might be worth a shot, you know, if you want to try out new and different techniques. Now, if you have like a little tear like this, don't worry about it. It's okay. Plus, keep in mind, these numbers are going to be getting strokes added to them. So if the edges are a little crude, it's not really an issue, as this will be corrected once the, the stroke gets fixed. Or I should say applied. Now, there are some different solutions to this. First, you can actually buy, I believe, a printer that does the cutouts like you see here. And if that's the case, I believe one of my buddies has one. It definitely might be something for me to look into because it will probably end up saving me a whole heap and load of time. Another way to go is to get a pre-made stencil set. These are, I believe, offered by armorpacks.com. His website is listed below. Now his stencils, I believe if he still makes them, were made from photo etch it was just a had all just the different numbers on it and from there you you put the number metal pieces on the side of the model paint them over and you have your stencil those sets are nice because those are obviously reusable these they are used once or twice and then you're basically done plus they're custom for the model with his you they are simpler and faster to apply however you are shoehorned again in the size and style of the markings that are present now he does have several different types so there are a few options available but this way here is more flexible in my opinion and you can really fine-tune the markings to what you deem fit fives are always Fives and nines, I think, are the hardest ones to do, but eights are tricky because you have those two dots, and those are usually have to be stuck onto the model separately. All right, there we have the 315. Now, I'm not, I'm going to spare you me cutting out the other ones, but I'll probably come back in for the crosses. All right, well, picking up where I left off, I have the two crosses cut out and two to go. Now, you notice this one here. Like I was saying before, it's for the two different colors. Here we have the black version, and here we have the version for the strokes. Now I'm just gonna finish off cutting these. Now I said before you can use a ruler for that, but honestly, I've done this so many times, I could probably just pull it off freehanded like I did on the last two markings. Now if you wanna save time, you can recycle the other ones. These stencils, in my experience, work for maybe one, two, three uses tops and after that the backing starts getting funky and it doesn't really stick as well and when it doesn't stick as well you're just gonna get a little bit more bleeding going on but for the crosses they're pretty much simple to cut out American stars are actually pretty easy too it's just mostly just a bunch of straight lines so yep there goes that do 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 Now, like the way I, I like to cut these out is that I just go in a downward direction because when you're moving downward, it's easier than when you're trying to go sideways. When you're going sideways, you can veer off a little bit, but if you're just starting from the top and going down, you have a likelihood, a better likelihood of keeping it in a straight line. You get test on the back. You can see if all the lines are cut out. And now I'm just gonna rotate it 90 degrees and cut out the remaining straightaways. Now also, there's going to be a point, if you're using a, a book like this one, where you once you make so many incisions, it just gets all bumbled up back here, you're going to have problems with the cutting blade. Where you're going to think the blade's dull, when in actuality it's just your surface needs to be re, repurposed. Which is why on a phone book is great, because you can just flip it to the opposite side, or you just rip out pages until you get a nice, fresh, flat surface for you to resume the cutting. So there's a lot of uh, tips in this video, a lot of how-tos. Uh, and this one, yeah, I missed these two here. 
Mm. Boop, and there we go. There goes my center, and now I'm just gonna do the same thing for the strokes. Miss any? Nope, I got them all. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. All right, well, markings are all set. Now it's time for me to cut them out and align them on the model so I can get them painted. Now once the marking is cut out, it's now time to affix the stencil to the side of the vehicle. Now this is where alignment is going to be absolutely crucial. Unlike a decal where if the piece ends up cockeyed or in the, right, or in the wrong spot, catch some drops of water and adjust it accordingly. With a stencil, it's basically like a tattoo, only not as painful to remove. Now to make sure I have these the markings in the correct locations. I went ahead and like I said before, I print out several just standard paper versions of the stencil when I was trying to figure out the scale. Once I had the scale figured out, I have this one marking over here and I cut it to the exact same specs as the other one that I cut out. So from here, I could just line it up and I get to see what the piece looks like without all that paper around it. When you have the paper around the stencil, it confuses you and you kind of lose your location where the hull and plate angles are. So this is a way to make sure that you're on an even keel. And this is where this guy's going to go. Okay, from here with a pencil, I'm going to lightly just draw where the cross is going to line up. Now you don't want to gouge into the paint, just a light pencil line on the surface is really all you need. There we go. It's not a full cross, but it's more than enough for me to index this guy over. Now the way these sticker papers are, is that on the back is there are these little serrated thin pieces of paper, which allows you to bend and to peel the piece off. Once the protective film is peeled off, this then allows you to adhere the marking or the stencil now to the tank. Okay. Make sure this guy lines up. Perfect. All right. Now that he's lined up, I'm not ready to add the paint yet. Note the areas around this stencil over here. If you go ahead and try to put paint on this section with some kind of an airbrush or a spray paint can, you're going to get a lot of overspray. So you're going to have to mask up quite a bit of the area around the surface. And this is where the other papers that I printed out to size up the markings come in handy. They're not going to waste and you're going to recycle them using them as, as overspray protectors. So. With a little bit of masking tape, you just stick them around the spot where they need to go. Now, when it comes to how much of a overspray protection you need, honestly, you can never have enough. I've had times when I fully masked up the entire area and I painted the marking and like that one little sliver that was left exposed was covered with a little tint of overspray and it was actually noticeable. So that's definitely something to watch out for. Now on some occasions, the overspray can actually help you out. Depends on really what you're looking for. I've seen several American vehicles that were clearly stenciled on where you had the star or the USA TONE marking and then you actually had a ghosted spray, overspray edge of where the stencil used to lie. If you're going with something like that, the stencil is definitely going to be a nice little handy trick because you just paint it on and it'll be, you'll get the realistic outcome on that. Now to apply the color, I'm going to be utilizing just an El Cheapo can of flat black spray paint. You can also go ahead and take this type of paint and put it into an airbrush and airbrush that onto the tank surface. I've used both 
methods in the past and both will work perfectly fine. When it comes to the spray paint though, you do need to have a little bit more control compared to an airbrush where you can fine tune the air volume from the compressor. Now, in addition to all of the mess that you see, I went ahead and even put a piece of cardboard behind the unit just to fully seal it off from any sort of overspray. Do a final press test, make sure the stencil is all on the surface. Get my can shaken up. All right, test it on the cardboard, it's all good, and here we go. And that's basically it. Now, you wanna be careful not to go too overly trigger happy with the paint, because if you add too much, obviously it's gonna cause drips and it will just add some more complications. Just a few passes like I did are more than enough to do the procedure. Okay, now that the area is all masked up, it's now time to spray on the white. Now, unlike the black where you wanna let the black fully dry before you peel off the stencil, with the white, I notice it works better after the unit is freshly applied and it's actually still wet. If you leave the stencil onto the marking once the paint adheres, the stencil is going to have a more difficult time with peeling off and you may have situations where you have some bleeding and paper chunks left behind. By peeling it off when it's still fresh, this gives it a nice clean, or I should say a cleaner crisp line, which should make it easier for the removal. Now for the white, just like with the black, I'm just going to use off the shelf flat white spray paint. A few, a few blasts in this area here should be more than enough to do the job. Now if you notice, I'm recycling the stencil from, or I should say the mask from the opposite side. There's no reason to go ahead and not reuse it since it's still holding up pretty well. Now I'm just gonna mask up the area just a little bit more just to prevent any sort of overspraying happening. And here we go. I just want to test on some cardboard. Make sure the paint is nice and mixed. Okay, excellent. All right, here we go. Sometimes these masks can get a little hairy. Okay, let's do this. All right. That's it for the paint application. Now I'm going to peel away the mass. You want to move in a nice, slow, methodical manner so you don't make contact with the wet paint. All right, here we go. And for the final reveal. And there we go. That came off pretty well. Now, I do have a slight little smear of white paint over there. That's not a problem. I'll touch that up with a paintbrush, as well as you can see some of the paint chipped off of the flat black. And this is a small little bit of bleeding going on, but nah, by and large, that's not too bad. This will definitely clean up well with a paintbrush. So now that this is all set, let's go ahead, let the paint fully dry, and then I'll be able to touch it up. Okay, so now that the black is touched up, you'll see that there are a couple chips here, there on the white. And to polish this off, just with some flat white paint, with a paintbrush, I'm just gonna go ahead and apply it by hand. Now this is where it pays to have a really good brush and an extremely steady hand. Which luckily for me, I have both going on right now. Okay, do the same to the opposite side. Okay, now that the white's touched up, I do see a small little bleeding on the black over here into the base coat. So we'll go ahead and touch that up too now. Now one nice thing about working with latex is that the paints, when they dry, they blend completely effortlessly with the rest of the base coat. Just a little overspray here, let's take care of that. 
All right. Now there is some slight overspray from the white and black on a few areas and also true on the opposite side. Now for these, these are best dealt with an airbrush as opposed to trying to paint something like this with hand. The airbrush gives it a better blend and look as opposed to something with some brush strokes.